It was accused of just being too big and bloated and not in keeping with what the previous generation MX-5s were all about. And you know what? Yeah. Now mechanically speaking, if you've gone and bought any other two-seater, two-door, rear-wheel drive convertible, well, you've bought the wrong one, and I'll tell you why. It makes you feel like you're going so much faster than you actually are, and that's what you want from a performance car. I just want to say a massive thank you to Edimitsu Oils for sponsoring this video, and more on those guys later. Okay, you might know this as the least loved of all of the Mazda MX-5s, but we argue it could actually be just the most misunderstood or maybe least appreciated of all the Mazda MX-5s. Don't get us wrong, it's far from perfect and we are going to be delving into all of the juicy details when it comes to the NC MX-5, but could this be one of the most underrated cars available right now? I'll tell you what, how about we find out, but first of all, unfortunately we've got to cover some of the bad news, what goes wrong with these? Let's start with the exterior. Okay, the most prevalent issue you're going to find has to do with the car's drainage holes, but even this can vary depending on which iteration of NC MX-5 you're looking at. Actually, there is something you really need to know about this. The NC MX-5 is the third generation of the model, but even it is available in three different iterations, and as either a soft top convertible, like this car, or as a Roadster Coupe, which has a power-operated three-piece retractable hardtop. But it's really important to know that each of these iterations, there's so much more than just a visual upgrade. Loads about them change, but we're going to be covering all of this as we go through the video. For example, and back to the drainage holes, on the NC2 and the NC3, the drainage holes were covered with a like a plastic mesh to hopefully stop crap going down them, but the problem with these is that it can make them more of a challenge to actually clean. Say for example you're competing in a motor Motorcana event on an off-road course, loads of dust will find its way into the crevices of the car, but then when you go to wash the car, all of the dust and the water becomes mud and then that blocks up your drainage holes. And also with the NC1s with the not mesh covered drainage holes, be really careful when you're cleaning these, especially if you're using like a trombone cleaner, because that can actually dislodge the little tube and then the interior can fill with water and that will just create a whole headache of issues. Actually those in the know recommend not using a trombone cleaner on any of the drainage holes at all just use compressed air but the hot tip here is to go to the owners groups and forums because there are plenty of awesome tutorials showing you how to clean the drainage holes properly okay next up a few owners of soft tops have complained that the leading edge here the glue that holds this down can discolor the fabric or even sort of start bubbling up and almost delaminating look chances are it's not going to leak or anything like that it just looks a bit ugly if you do want to get it repaired owners have been quoted prices around about the two and a half thousand dollar region to replace or fix the roof in saying that if you're kind of okay with how ugly it can be and you're looking at one it might actually give you more bargaining power to uh, reduce the price also on potential water leakage issues the windscreen cow the little clips can break and that can let water into the car but the good news here is it's super cheap and easy to fix Actually, you know what? That is something you're going to hear me say a whole lot about this car. So many of the common problems are just so cheap and easy to fix. Okay, now owners of hard top variants in really, really hot climates like here in Australia, if the car has been kept outside or it hasn't been cleaned or polished on the regular, they've had some issues with the clear coat fading on top of the roof. Also, the paint in general across the whole car doesn't have a great reputation. In fact, this is something we've seen on Mazda's time and time again, but the paint is quite thin, so expect it to chip and mark pretty easily. In fact, loads of MX-5 owners have fitted the cars with PPF film just to, just to protect the paint. Okay, now this next issue, it does affect cold climates far more than places like Australia, but there are some reports of rust around the rear wheel arches and along the sills. Also, clogged drainage holes can exacerbate this issue. Just check the car for rust. Actually, just on the rust thing, if you are watching from a climate like Australia and there are signs of rust on the MX-5, that's a pretty good indication that the thing has had an accident and the repairs have been done on the Dodge, or very cheaply, because these things shouldn't rust in warm climates. Actually, you know what, like any used car, it is just critical to learn as much about the vehicle's history as you possibly can. So A, get a pre-purchase inspection carried out, and B, hit the re-driven link down below to get yourself a vehicle history check. That'll tell you if there's any money owing on the car, if it's ever been stolen, or if it's been written off. Now, there are a few reports out there of the seal around the tail lights and also the high-mounted rear brake light just kind of perishing by now. It can cause a few little issues. But guess what? Again, it's super cheap and easy to fix. Now, just on the cost of certain spare parts even within the MX-5 range. If you're tossing up between buying one of these or maybe an ND, say you've got to replace the windscreen in one of these, you're going to be looking about 350 bucks. 
On the ND, because their windscreen has a whole bunch of safety tech built into it and you've got to get it recalibrated from the dealership when you get a new windscreen, you're going to be looking at around about $4,000. It's a bit of a price difference. Now when it comes to replacing tyres, you might notice that the standard fitment, which is a 205 45 17, there's not much choice, especially when it comes to a premium tyre, and they're bloody expensive. Those in the know recommend fitting a 215 45 17 because you're going to have way more choice and they're going to be cheaper. And are you going to be able to tell if the car's got any handling characteristic differences? Look, not unless you've got Max Verstappen or Oscar Piastri levels of skill, no. Probably not. Now, owners have reported that the rear struts and even the bump stops can wear pretty much prematurely, but before you go running out to fit a full set of coilovers, do your homework, because plenty of owners have claimed that even quality coilovers can completely ruin the dynamics of the car. Look, this is really going to depend on what you want the car to do, how you want it to handle, what you're actually going to do with it, where you live, all that sort of stuff. But the good news here again is there is so much advice in the owners groups and the forums. And the really good news here is that you don't have to spend a whole lot of money to get these things to handle incredibly well. Actually, loads of owners mentioned to us that just fit premium tires, some really good brakes and sort the suspension tune out, and this thing is gonna be one hell of a car. Also, because these are so light, even in hard top form, the hard top's only about 40 kilograms heavier than the soft top, Plenty of owners have stated that they're getting multiple track days out of a single set of tyres and brakes. And look, I know I'm going to rant on about owners groups and forums all through this video, but I've got to say, out of all the groups that we joined to research these videos, the NC community has to be easily, easily one of the best we've ever dealt with. Their knowledge and advice is just priceless. Actually, I've got to say a special thank you to Bob DeBont, George Nickus, and Reese Linden. You guys are legends. Thank you so much for all your help. Now, we will be covering what goes wrong with the interior and the mechanical stuff in a sec, but just on the engines, internationally, you guys have had the choice of either a 1.8 or 2-litre, but here in Australia, we only received the 2-litre engine. Although, it's important to know that there are quite a few mechanical differences between the NC1 and the NC2 and 3. See, the internals on the NC2 and 3 were substantially upgraded. The forged crankshaft, upgraded pistons, new valve springs, new connecting rod bearings, loads was changed all to improve durability. And did that work? Well, Jim, our resident mechanic, will answer that question shortly. Also, there are far more manual transmission MX-5s on the used market compared to the automatics, and that's how it should be. An automatic MX-5 should be considered as some kind of sacrilege unless of course you need an automatic for medical reasons and then I'm, I'm terribly sorry now locally we've had primarily two different trim specs to choose from with a handful of special editions but internationally haven't you guys had a smorgasbord of choice from over 20 different limited or special editions in addition to your regular models so much choice and look obviously there's so much more to the nc than just that and if you do need all the specific details as well as the common issues all listed out so they're really easy to refer to Go to redriven.com and check out the free NC MX-5 cheat sheet. It's basically the ultimate NC buyer's guide. Now, another common complaint with the NC, but this is actually more to do with when it was brand new, was just how it looked. See, it was accused of just being too big and bloated and not in keeping with what the previous generation MX-5s were all about. And you know what? Yeah, I used to agree up until about five years ago. Now, I don't know how the designers have done this, but I feel like the NC is almost the, is the car equivalent of blue cheese or red wine or an aged Japanese whiskey. Not things that you like the first time you consume them, but then with age and experience and just life, it becomes this acquired taste that personally, I have become completely obsessed with. Actually, you know what? Sam behind the camera and I, I think we've lost count of how many times he and I have said this to each other, but we always go, Man, NC MX-5, that thing's looking really good these days, especially if it's lowered a little bit and wearing a set of Enki RPF1s like this. I mean, how, like how good does that thing look? It's so hot. Is that thing a hairdresser's car? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, it's not. Now to what goes wrong inside, and the big complaint here is that sometimes the seat belts fail to retract back into their little homes. Now, this is a super easy fix. You just wash them until the seatbelt becomes malleable again. Basically, the seatbelt just builds up with life's filth and gets quite firm, and the spring resistance in the little mechanism fails to suck it back in. Interestingly, on the NC2 and 3, that mechanism was made a little bit stronger, so it will suck them in better. Basically, if you've got an NC1 and you've washed the seatbelt and it still doesn't retract, just swap out the mechanism with an NC2 or NC3 mechanism, and you won't have a problem. Very cheap and easy. Okay, next up, and honestly, this is a pretty rare complaint, hardly any reports of it, just little electronic gremlins, specifically with the window switches just here. They can 
just glitch out a little bit. Again, cheap and easy to fix. The problem is if you've got one of the hard tops, the actual roof mechanism is part of this electronic system here. And if that goes, it means that you can't open or shut the roof. And if you can't shut the roof and it starts to rain, that's gonna be a problem. Again, we wouldn't be too stressed about this because it hardly ever happens. Now, plenty of owners also mentioned that the Series 1 seats aren't anywhere near as comfortable or supportive as the Series 2 and 3 seats, especially these wonderful Recaros. These things are fantastic. A lot of the issues can be about the actual seating position, but there are plenty of lowering kits for all of the seats out there. Just check the legalities on where you live regarding the lowering kits because some places, they're completely illegal. Actually, just on these particular Recaro seats, I'm exactly five centimeters taller than Celebrity MX-5 owner Benedict Cumberbatch, and I find these seats absolutely superb. I was expecting them to be a bit too race car, but they are actually really, really comfortable. I would like it to lower about this much more. I think that would be perfect, and if the steering wheel could just come out to me just a smidge more, it would be absolutely perfect. But the seats, if you can afford the Recaros, get them in your NC, because these are sensational. Actually, just on this interior in general, look, I used to own an NA MX-5 up until really recently, and we reviewed an ND MX-5 a little while ago, and this interior, it definitely feels more comfortable and spacious than both of those cars. It's set out so, so well. But at the same time, it hasn't lost any of the MX-5 vibe. It still feels compact and sporty and wraps around you. And I just love it has this no bullshit approach to a car interior. It's just great. It's exactly what a little sports car should feel like. However, a few owners have complained that some of the materials in here a, aren't great in quality, and B, aren't all that resilient. Some of the leather, it can actually kind of wear a little bit. Even in this seat, the um, bolsters are kind of wearing the leather a little bit. And some of the hard plastics, if the car hasn't been cared for a lot or if it's kept outside a lot, some of the plastics can get a bit brittle and then that starts to rattle. No reports of anything breaking or falling off or anything, but yeah, higher kilometre, older, sort of slightly used ones can feel a little dodgy. However, in saying that, when you read through the owners groups and forums, you'll get the opposite opinions as well of people stating that these interiors are incredibly resilient. In fact, one of the guys I spoke to, Bob, his car's got nearly 300,000 Ks on it and he sent me some photos and it looks fantastic. So again, if it's cared for, they last. Now, another complaint, and this is sort of understandable considering the age of the car, is just the lack of tech in here. Even the stereos and the standard models are pretty rubbish. The 200 watt Bose stereo that comes in the higher spec, it is an improvement, but it's still not, not that, all that great. Obviously, forget about any kind of modern phone connectivity like Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, Bluetooth, not gonna have any of that. But the good news here is there are so many aftermarket kits available to fit all that sort of technology. And while you're at it, why not fit a reverse camera? Maybe some parking sensors. And whatever other technology your heart desires. And look, aside from the infotainment tech, apparently the air conditioning in the early Series 1 cars, it can struggle a little bit on really, really hot days. And also some of the safety calibrations, like the stability control calibrations on the early ones, it can be extremely aggressive when it comes in. But overall, as far as what stuff you get, it's a decent amount of stuff for a car in this age bracket and style and genre. And look, obviously the higher up the food chain you go, the more stuff you are gonna get. But the good news is that's about it for common interior complaints. There's not much else that goes wrong with these interiors. And again, if you do need all the specific details of which MX-5 gets what sort of gear, redriven.com, it's all listed on the cheat sheet. Now, as far as actually using the interior in terms of practicality, so many of these two-seat sports car convertible things are bloody rubbish when it comes to practicality. But this thing, actually pretty good. It's got a decent size glove box. In the doors you've got some cup holders and a little net that's about good enough to hold itself. That's really about it. You've got a spot that holds your phone really nicely here, especially if you've got a good case because it won't slide around everywhere. Another spot in the center console here which will also hold your phone and your favorite Bic pen. You've got a little cubby hole here and that's where your little latch for the fuel filler is. Behind the seats you've got really decent size little cubby holes just there. Oh, I should also mention, this one is lockable, which is super handy. I think for a car this size and this genre, that's a good amount of practicality. Now we need to say a massive thank you to Chris Andrew for lending us his MX-5. They're currently the quickest standard car in this year's MX-5 Club Track Day Championship, and they hold the record for the quickest standard NC at Ludnam, posting a 55 flat, which is extremely respectable. Make sure you check out Chris's exploits on both YouTube and Instagram, and also a massive thank you to the boys at Go Garage for introducing us to Chris, and also for importing some awesome cars. Now, as far as space in the boot goes, good news here, it is noticeably larger than the boot space of an ND or an NA and B MX-5. In fact, it's so big, you could easily fit some carry-on luggage in here, get away for a weekend, 
really good. Okay, what goes wrong with the driving experience? Well, first of all, owners of Series 1 cars have complained that the gear change between first and second can be a little overly notchy. Now, this should sort itself out once the transmission gets up to the right temperature, but unless the thing's grinding like crazy or it's near impossible to get into gear, I wouldn't worry too much. It shouldn't be too much of an issue. Secondly, you might read complaints from motoring journalists stating that because this thing is bigger and heavier than the previous generations, it lacks the sparkle and magic of those cars. Well, here's the thing. Mazda from the factory calibrated the suspension geometry very, very conservatively. Actually, to the point that it seems like they were trying to give the car this very settled and solid feel, which is obviously basically the polar opposite to uh, what the first two generations were trying to achieve. But talk to those in the know when talking people that actually race these things, fit some premium quality rubber and sort the suspension geometry out and it can completely transform the car. And you've got to remember, this thing has a superior power to weight ratio over the previous generation NB. So it does make sense that the reason this might feel a bit subdued and muted is because of the way the suspension geometry is set up. But the question is, does a change to the suspension geometry really make the difference? Oh my God, yes it does. Now to put things into perspective, up until recently I owned an NA MX-5 that actually had an NB 1.8 litre engine in it, and I completely, completely adored that car. But this, this is better in every way. And look, obviously this thing is superior when it comes to the sensible stuff. It doesn't rattle anywhere near as much. It does feel more refined. It is easier to live with every single day. And it also, it feels more substantial on the road. And that's good because it gives you more confidence when you're driving on the freeway or even just in you know, Sydney traffic. But you know what? No matter what speed, like around this roundabout, <laughs> <laughs> the steering feel is so, so good in this. I was reverse parking it before, and even just doing a reverse park is fun because the steering is so bloody good. And then you've got this shift feel. I mean, this is incredible. It actually, it makes you wonder why BMW can't engineer this level of addictive tactility into their manual transmissions, even in cars costing four or five times as much. And then with this engine, like it has decent torque down and low, but then you rev it out. Ah, <laughs> that's just, oh man, it's so good. And even, okay, I know I keep raving about it, but even the suspension, because this thing is so light, it doesn't have to worry about the car pitching and rolling. It can just focus on soaking up bumps and providing phenomenal handling. And my God, doesn't it? Like just around about, what, 30K an hour? Yes. Yes! Oh, so much yes. Look, honestly, this is one of the best driving experiences you are ever going to have. And a huge part of that is because it makes you feel like you're going so much faster than you actually are. And that's what you want from a performance car. You can have all the fun without worrying about your license and where the cops are. This thing is just phenomenal. Look, I loved my NA MX-5, and I know everybody loves the NA and NB because they're raw and whatnot. But being honest with you, as a daily driver, the novelty does wear off pretty quickly and it just gets tiring, but this thing, it doesn't. It's just comfortable enough to live with every day, but then when you do push it, it's just as rewarding. And last year we tested an ND MX-5 and of all the cars we tested that year, that was by far my favourite one to actually drive. That means it beat an R34 GTR, an A45 AMG and a whole bunch of amazing cars, including a couple of Porsches, but that was my pick. But this... This is easily as good. Look, I'm sure you can tell I am so in love with this car, but in saying that, we haven't covered what mechanically can go wrong. What's the story there? Well, you know what? Unfortunately, I can't tell you because I'm not a qualified mechanic. But you know who is? Hang on a sec. Corners, 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 corners. You know who is? It's Jim. Mechanically speaking, this week, really, there's not much point in me even being here because really not much goes wrong. But there are a couple of things we should talk about. We have seen on a few occasions the purge valve can fail, giving you some lean air fuel ratio fault codes, easy to fix. I have seen a couple with failed EGR valves too. Again, super easy to fix and not that expensive. Higher mileage, let's say 100,000 Ks and up, you might see a valve cover oil leak not that complicated. But what is complicated is the fuel filter and fuel pump module in these. If you ever need to change that for any reason, it is very difficult to get at. You've got to take half of the rear area apart just to get at it. It's a few hour job, unnecessarily complicated really. But thankfully it hardly ever fails, so you're not likely to need to do that. Some very early versions of these did have variable valve timing gear issues. 
made a bit of a rattle, usually fixed under warranty, not common though. One thing you should keep an eye on is the cooling system expansion tank. They are known to occasionally split open. Um, not so common as a daily driver, but if you're tracking it, yeah, definitely keep an eye on that. And if it should split open and you're on track or leaning on it too hard and you don't notice, you can quite easily have an overheating event. Now, in these cars, they do not like overheating and chances are, well, if it's a bad enough overheating event, you're gonna do serious, serious damage to it. Not just head gasket issues. I've seen these things warp the actual block and they just scrap after that. So yeah, keep an eye on that. Maybe just play it safe and get one of the multiple aftermarket expansion tanks for it. That way you won't have to worry about it. And speaking of head gaskets, keep the coolant fresh in these things. If they get a bit of corrosion in these, the head gasket will be a problem. So keep the coolant changed, keep it within spec. And if you're gonna track it too, there have been some reports in the Gen 1s of these having some oil starvation issues. The Gen 2 and 3 are better for that and the bottom ends are actually stronger too. And those in the know will tell you that the Gen 2 and 3 are far better platforms to go tracking. Transmission wise, some people complain that they are a bit notchy and the synchros can be a bit crunchy. Look, good oil does definitely help with that. And if you're still having crunching issues, take a good look at the clutch pedal bracket, they do actually split and that affects the way the clutch works, obviously. There are a whole bunch of aftermarket things you can do to rectify that, but yeah, fairly common problem. Overall, mechanically speaking, look, like every car, I can't emphasize enough, you need to service it properly and you need to use the right oil, which is actually why we've joined forces with Itamitsu oils. Now, fun fact, you've probably already experienced Itamitsu oils because they've been in the game since 1911 and they've been producing OEM oils for Japanese brands like Toyota, Lexus, Mazda, and Honda, and Subaru for years, actually decades. And that is arguably why Japanese engine manufacturers have got such a good reputation for performance and reliability. See, where a lot of oil brands just have one formula that covers a bunch of different applications, Itamitsu's nano-tailored technology is designed to meet and often exceeds the high demands placed on modern Japanese engines. And best of all, you can now experience Japan's best motor oil in your car. Check out the full range by clicking the link below. But there's something else we need to discuss and it's what else could you buy for NC MX-5 money? When we're talking small rear wheel drive two seat drop tops asking between ten dollars to $30,000, you have everything from the BMW Z3 and Z4, various Mercedes-Benz SLK, the uh, let's say interesting MGF and TF, Toyota's MR2 in a couple of different generations, the Honda S660, or maybe a pretty tired S2000, and even early Porsche Boxsters. But just back to what else you could buy instead of an NC MX-5, arguably its biggest competition comes from its siblings. We've said this before on Redriven, but it really doesn't matter which generation of MX-5 you're looking at, they are all exceptional in their own way. And you know what, if you'd asked us before researching and filming this video, if we really had to pick which MX-5 would you buy, we would have said, buy the most recent ND MX-5 that you can possibly afford. But ask us now, and we've changed our mind. It's this. Sort the suspension tune, fit some premium performance tyres, and bang for your buck, no other car can light up your life like an NC MX-5. Obviously, don't buy a shit one unless you're planning on turning it into a track car or you want a project to work on, but you need to buy an NC MX-5. Even if you can only borrow the right NC for a few hours, do it because it's gonna make your life better. Look, I've been lucky enough to drive a whole host of McLarens and Lamborghinis and pretty much every Porsche wearing a GT badge. But I honestly, I can't remember ever being this just enthralled and enamoured with a car like the NC MX-5. And to think this thing only costs about $20,000. It's mind-blowing. However, if you are tempted by something like this, there's another car that costs about this much. It's just as fun to drive. It's way more practical. And I think it's even more unique. It's one of these. But if you wanted to buy something like this or this, what else would you buy? Let us know in the comments. We'll see you next time. But also, it hasn't lost any of the MX-5 vibe. It just still feels, what are the words, Sam? What are the words? But all of these have their own, let's say, pros and cons. Some of them might, there we go.